good to let's have a look what financial statements was all about what you should know what you shouldn't know what you should focus on um, the first thing it is all about financial statements so obviously this whole thing is all about disclosure now there are two statements that we've done up till now the first one the statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income which is your income statement. What is important here is when I have two streams of income that my buy and sell activity will have sales, cost of sales and gross profit and any other fee related income will be shown in a separate line item under other operating income like service income, whatever kind of income that is. So that second income stream, that revenue, is not added into my sales revenue because the reason for that is my gross profit won't make sense then. Right, then statement of financial position. You should know exactly what the layout is. You should know exactly that I do not put all kinds of unnecessary line items on the, on the, on the face of the statement of financial position. You should know exactly what the notes to the financial statements look like. First thing is um, accounting policy, inventory, allowance accounts. And then the third thing that I forgot to put in here is depreciation. So on the inventory note, you should be able to write inventory is shown at the lowest of cost or net realizable value. You will say that net realizable value equals the expected selling price of an item after all compulsory selling uh, uh, cost selling and distribution costs have been deducted from the proceeds um, then what is important is that you should also measure how it has been valued is it first in first out um, specific identification or weighted average method then allowance accounts you should tell the reader that the company or the entity makes use of allowance accounts um, if it is allowance on credit losses, you should also mention the percentage if they work on a percentage basis or if they work on a specific data basis, you should, uh, you should mention that and tell them exactly how that allowance is being calculated. Then um, depreciation. Yeah, if it's a policy to make use of allowance for settlement discount accounts, you should men mention that and probably also the credit terms is a good idea to mention in that note. Depreciation, you should uh, tell the reader that you are recording your non-current assets at cost, um, less accumulated depreciation. Depreciation is calculated by using whatever method. Um, if there are different classes of assets, you should say depreciation is calculated as follows. Um, let's say, for instance, land and buildings at 2% per annum on the straight line method. Vehicles 25% per annum on the reducing balance method and machinery and equipment on the production unit method. So whatever method you're going to apply on whatever class asset, that should be mentioned. And if there's a percentage uh, applicable like the production, oh, not the production, the, the reducing balance or the straight line method, you should also mention the percentage. With the production unit method, you're not going to mention obvious things like total capacity because that is the method that the thing is calculated. Then the second note is going to be on inventory. So you're going to show there all your classes of inventory items. At this point of time, you will probably only have trading inventory and consumable stock. Then you should also mention if there was a neutralizable value adjustment during the year. If there was, you should mention the fact. You should also mention the amount involved in the NRV adjustment and the reason why it was necessary to create an NRV adjustment for the year. Trade and other receivables, you will start with your gross debtors, i.e. your debtors control account balance, less allowance for settlement discount, less allowance for credit losses, equals net trade debtors, and then you will add to that things like um, prepaid expenses, deposits, Deposits only when that deposit is claimable somewhere in the future back from the entity where the, which is holding the deposit, um, then you will mention that deposit. Um, accrued income, that will also, and VAT, VAT, VAT control, if it has a debit balance, that will also be shown in the note of other and other receivables. 
On the face of the statement of financial position and the current assets, you will only have one line item inventory, one line item trade and other receivables. And then obviously with a reference to a note number where you explain what the breakdown of that figure is. Cash and cash equivalents, what is important here that you know the definition of cash and cash equivalents. Cash and cash equivalents are those kind of cash assets that can be uh, transferred into cash in a period within three months. So if you can convert something into cash in a three month period, which is a cash related kind of investment, uh, that will be shown under cash and cash equivalents. If that investment like a fixed deposit has a maturity date longer than three months after year end, but shorter than 12 months after year end, it does not form part of non-current assets because the maturity date of the investment is not for a period longer than 12 months after year end. And then you will show that kind of investment as a separate line item under, other, under current assets, um, let's say financial asset, and under that one, that will then be your fixed deposit, which is going to mature, as let's say, in a six-month period. Right. Fixed deposits is going to uh, uh, mature within a period longer than 12 months after year end. That obviously form part of non-current assets and should be shown separately under non-current assets with a note associated to that with what it consists of. And there you know it can consist of either uh, cash kind of, of assets like fixed deposits or uh, share-based investments like investment in listed shares and investment in non-listed shares. And the full particulars of that investment should be disclosed by ways of the note. Trade and other payables, there you should have the note, you will start with your trade payables, your trade creditors balance, lease your allowance for settlement discount on creditors, net trade creditors, and then other types of creditors like income received in advance, accrued expenses, and then your VAT control account if it's got a credit balance. Short-term portion of a long-term loan, now what we've said is if the maturity date of a long-term loan is longer than 12 months after year end, that should be shown as a non-current liability. If I have a non-current liability where I'm going to repay some of that liability within the next 12 months after year end, that portion repayable within the next 12 months should be shown as the short-term portion of the long-term loan and the current liabilities on a separate line item. So you do not include this in trade and other payables, it has its own line item, undercurrent liabilities, short-term portion of long-term loan with whatever the amount is. Remember, if I'm going to write a, a note on that loan, the long-term loan is going to have the total outstanding balance as at the end of the year. You have to state that balance. Then you will say less short-term portion transfer to current liabilities, which you're going to deduct from that, and you will end up with the long-term portion of a long-term loan, which will be shown as a non-current liability, the short-term portion is not this portion, which I have spoken about. Also, you have to give us the repayment terms, the, 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 all the terms that are surrounding this uh, long-term liability in the note, what is the interest rate applicable, what is the repayment terms, etc., etc. But I still want to tell you something about VAT once more. Let's run through the scenarios of VAT. Number one, the entity is a VAT vendor, but anti buys from a VAT vendor. So what is going to happen when he buys from a VAT vendor? That VAT vendor is going to issue a VAT invoice. Because we are VAT vendors as well, we will be able to claim the VAT on the product that we have purchased or on the expense item. We will debit the asset if it was the asset that we bought from that VAT vendor, which will be the VAT exclusive amount on the invoice. We're going to debit VAT input, so we're going to claim the VAT on the invoice, and we're going to credit the supplier or bank if we have paid already. And the supplier or the bank will always include VAT. It will always be including the um, or be equal to the VAT invoiced amount. The second scenario, the entity is not a VAT vendor, but it buys from a VAT vendor. Now that VAT vendor is going to issue a VAT invoice to us. We are not a VAT vendor, so we cannot claim that VAT. 
Therefore, let's say we have purchased an asset. We will debit the asset with a very inclusive price, i.e. the invoice value. And we will create a supplier with a VAT inclusive amount, i.e. the invoice value. So we cannot claim the VAT because we are not the VAT vendor. But the VAT portion of the invoice issued by this VAT vendor will then be capitalized as part of the cost price of the asset. The third scenario is the entity is a VAT vendor and it sells to a VAT vendor. Now, in a sales transaction, it does not really matter whether the, the person that we're selling to is a VAT vendor or not. The fact that we are a VAT vendor in a sales transaction or in a transaction where we're going to receive cash, like for instance, we're going to sell an asset, a non-current asset, and we're going to receive cash for that. The fact that we are a VAT vendor uh, tells us that we have to pay over the VAT on that specific transaction. So if this was a sales transaction, we would have debited the data with the invoice amount. So that will always include VAT. We would have created sales with a VAT exclusive amount and created VAT output with a VAT on the invoice. If there was an allowance for settlement discount, obviously we would have broken down this line item into two legs. The settlement discount, let's assume there's a 5% settlement discount applicable and we expect the data to make use of that discount. 5% of the VAT exclusive amount will go to the allowance for settlement discount. 95% of the VAT exclusive account will go to the sales account. The third scenario, the entity is a non-VAT vendor, so we cannot claim VAT, and it sells to a VAT vendor. Well, because we cannot claim VAT, we also cannot pay over VAT because we are not a registered VAT vendor with a receiver of revenue. So, we're going to debit the data with the invoice amount, which will always be an exclusive amount because we are a non-VAT vendor and we are not able to issue a VAT invoice. And we're going to credit sales with the amount of the invoice. Cannot raise VAT because we're not a vendor. Now, the last scenario is that the entity is a VAT vendor and it sells to a non-VAT vendor. And that, again, doesn't matter. The fact that we are a VAT vendor means that on all income that we're going to receive, we have to pay over 15% included in that amount, which will equal the VAT amount to the receiver of revenue. So the data will always be debited at the invoice amount, which will include VAT. Sales will always be the VAT exclusive amount, and the VAT output will be the VAT on the invoice that we have issued. It doesn't matter whether the buyer is a VAT vendor or not. If there was an allowance for settlement discount, this amount would have been broken up into two legs, uh, let's say, again, 5% settlement discount, 5% of the VAT exclusive amount would have gone to the allowance for settlement discount, and then the 95% of the VAT exclusive amount we would have posted to sales. Now, all these scenarios also applies when we are going to work with property, plant, and equipment. When we purchase property, plant, and equipment, we're going to debit, and we are a VAT vendor, and we're going to buy from a VAT vendor. It means the VAT vendor that we're going to buy from is going to issue a VAT invoice. So we will debit the asset as a VAT exclusive amount. We will debit the VAT input, and we will credit the supplier with the full amount of the VAT invoice. If we're going to purchase property, plant, and equipment from a non-VAT vendor, and we are registered for VAT, it means that the person from whom we're going to acquire the property, plant, and equipment will not be able to issue a VAT invoice. Therefore, that VAT, which is not going to be there, um, can, well, let me put it to you differently. The invoice value is going to be now the cost price of the asset because this guy will not be able to have VAT on his invoice. So then the invoice value will become the cost price of the asset. The same thing applies to when we are a VAT vendor. Whenever we're going to sell the asset, it doesn't matter to whether we're going to sell it to a VAT vendor or a non-VAT vendor, but we are a VAT vendor, and if we're going to sell the asset, that proceeds that we're going to receive on the asset that we've sold will include VAT, and we will have to pay VAT over to the receiver of revenue on all sales proceeds of all kinds of assets. Obviously, if we are not a VAT vendor, and we're going to sell then to a VAT vendor, the fact that we are not a non-VAT vendor will then um, ensure that there is no VAT that we have to pay over to the receiver of revenue because we are not registered for VAT. It doesn't matter to whom and to what we are selling that asset to.
Now, in all these financial statement questions, there are different kind of adjustment entries that you have to pass. So let's just run through the most popular adjustment entries that we require you to do. The first one is all kinds of adjustment entries on inventory. Now, the first thing that you have to be able to do is to work out the value of closing inventory. Because closing inventory is the inventory that you're going to show in the statement of financial position, and it also has an impact on my statement of profit or loss. Determine the type of valuation method that the entity uses. Does he use first in, first out? Does he use a weighted average? Does he use a specific identification? Now, if he uses um, either one of the three, you're going to determine the value of closing inventory. Now, you know that those figures are going to change each time whether I'm using the periodic inventory system or the perpetual inventory system. Make sure that you can work out inventory by applying both those systems and these valuation methods on those systems. Now, um, you must be able to know what a net realizable value adjustment is. So we've said that the inventory should be shown in the statement of financial position at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Now, here it's very important that you also distinguish between whether we are using a perpetual inventory system or a periodic inventory system. Under a perpetual inventory system, we have an inventory account in our books, and all movements that takes place is being accounted for in the inventory account. So should there have been an inventory loss, I would have credited my inventory account, I would have debited an inventory loss account under the perpetual system once more, and that inventory loss account would have been closed off at the end of the year against cost of sales if it is trading inventory, and if it is consumable stock, it would have been a normal operating expense. The same thing applies to neutralizable value. Under the perpetual inventory system, once we have performed the neutralizable value test, and let's say that we find that on some inventory items, the neutralizable value of that item is less than the cost price of those items. We have to write those items down to neutralizable value. So under the perpetual system, we would have credited our inventory account and debited the neutralizable value adjustment account, which at the end of the year, if it's trading inventory, will be closed off against cost of sales. And if it was uh, consumable stocks, it would have been shown that neutralizable value adjustment as a normal operating expense. Now, under periodic inventory system, what do we do? Under periodic inventory system, we do not post anything against inventory. All purchases of inventory items takes place in a purchases account, and so also so the purchase-related costs. Everything will have its own tier account. At the end, all those individual tier accounts will be closed off against cost of sales. Also at the end, what do we do? We take the opening inventory, which is still lying in our inventory account, not untouched for the whole year, and we're going to clean that out to the cost of sales. So we will credit our inventory account with the opening inventory figure, and we will debit cost of sales with the opening inventory figure. Now we have to determine what is closing inventory. I say again, under the periodic system, we do a physical stock count, that we do in both. We do a physical stock count, and we assign a value based on our inventory methodology on the inventory on hand at year end. Then we're going to say, well, um, if we know that some of that items that we've uh, now determined the value of, if that value is not the true and correct value of our closing inventory on hand, we have to adjust that. So if I'm going to refer back to Bath and Tal, there after they have performed the closing, uh, the, the physical stock tag and determine the value of the closing inventory to be 124,000 or something like that, they have discovered after the 124,000 that there was stock theft. So then it meant that that 124,000 was not the final value of the closing inventory. I have to adjust the closing inventory figure to the final value because under the periodic system only record inventory, closing inventory once. I debit inventory, I credit cost of sales. So the 124,000 was not the final amount. I had to subtract from that the inventory that was stolen. And then I was with a cost price of goods really truly on hand at year end. What we're going to do then is, then we're going to perform the net realizable value test. And then we have actually found that 
Now the value of stock that we have determined at year end is not, that's the cost price of the stock on hand, but for some of that items, the net realizable value was lower than the cost price. So that means that that final figure, 124,000 in that example, there's 6,000 of art. That was also not the final inventory figure because for some of that inventory was actually only worth less than the cost price. And then we're actually going to write down the net realizable value adjustment from that figure. So to calculate at the end of the day, what is the actual value of closing inventory that we want in our books. Once we have determined on a piece of paper then the value of the figure that we want the closing inventory to be, then we're going to pass an entry in our financial records where we're going to debit our inventory account with a final figure and credit cost of sales with a final figure of inventory on hand. Another concept that we came across in all these questions was something like consignment stock. Now you should know that consignment stock does not belong to the entity. Let's say that Aunt Sarah on the farm cooks the most wonderful jam. She goes to town and she asks Papadopoulos at the spa, she says, Mr. Papadopoulos, can you please sell my nice jars of jam? He says, Aunt Sarah, I would like to do that, but really, I've got all gold, I've got coo, I've got all these nice jams in my shop, but I can, I can do something for you. I will give you space on my shelves. And there you can display all your jams on, this, on, on, on those shelves. And whenever you're going to sell some of that jam, it's obviously going to go through our tools. But you have a separate barcode on your jam, so we can identify the amount that we're going to receive for the jams that we've sold on your behalf. And I will pay to you. In return, for me being so nice, you have to pay me X amount of money every month for the privilege of displaying your jams on my shelves. And for me then, obviously, to administer the sales transaction and pay the amounts of the proceeds of the sales over to you. So when Mr. Papadopoulos is going to go and do a stock count of his physical stock on hand in the spot, he cannot add in into his stock count figure the value of Aunt Sarah's jam because it doesn't belong to him. It belongs to Aunt Sarah. If that um, uh, uh, jam is going to get little uh, sugar crystals in, then it means it's not going to be a Papadopoulos problem. Aunt Sarah has to come. She has to remove those jams from the shelf and she can put in uh, on the shelves new bottles of jam, which is not uh, full of little uh, sugar crystals. So that means the only thing Mr. Mr. Papadopoulos has is he's administer at a fee the income on the sale of that jam. But all the risks and rewards of the and ownership of ownership of those jam actually belongs to Mrs. Um, Onsara. So that stock will never form part of the stock of Mr. Papadopoulos. So you cannot add it into his closing inventory. Another um, concept that you came into uh, contact with in one of your questions, there was stock in transit. I can't remember the question. I think it was RAPTAC or one of those. Um, what happened there is the, the entity had two warehouses. The one warehouse was in Johannesburg and the other warehouse was in Cape Town. Now, at the year end, they performed a physical stock take on the two warehouses, but somewhere in between, there was stock in transit. So in a truck, there was a lot of stock that was not counted in into the Johannesburg warehouse, neither it was counted into the Joburg uh, warehouse because it wasn't on the premises. It doesn't take away the fact that that stock belongs to the entity and the value or the cost price of that stock should have been added to the physical stock on hand at year end. So stock in transit, make sure that should you adjust your closing inventory with some uh, stock that wasn't counted into the physical stock on hand for whatever good or bad reason, in this case it was not in one of the warehouses, it was on the road, you have to adjust your closing inventory to add in all those items of stock not counted in, like in this question, the stock which was in transit between the two warehouses. Inventory losses, I've already referred to inventory losses. In a perpetual inventory system, there will be a physical entry that you're going to pass in your books. You're going to credit your inventory account and you're going to debit an expense account inventory losses. And that expense account, if it was trading inventory, will be closed off against cost of sales at the end of the year. It, if it was consumable stock, it would have been shown as a normal operating expense under the gross profit line in your statement of profit or loss 
for the year. Right. Try to know the receivables. Now, there you should know that you're going to start with your debtors control balance, and that is the invoice value of all the sale, credit sales transactions, which was not settled at year end. It's very important that you make that connection between debtors control balance and invoice value, because if you don't have that connection, you are going to battle with all kinds of adjustment entries that you have to pass. Now, um, we can ask you to do some adjustment entries of incorrect postings, of late sales transactions, credit sales. Right? This is all about credit sales, not cash sales, always only credit sales, etc. Et the, the fact of the matter is, before you can do anything further with that balance, like working out your allowance for credit losses, it must be a fully updated balance. So you have to pass all the adjustment entries first before you're going to do the final entries, for instance, for the allowance for credit losses. The allowance for settlement discount, guys, how do we calculate the allowance for settlement discount? We take the invoice, we take out the VAT, we multiply that with the settlement discount percentage. So you had examples there, very good question, I can't remember his name also now off my head, where I gave you the correct balance of the settlement discount allowance account as at the beginning of the period. And I didn't tell you what the debtor's control balance was at the beginning of the period. And you had to work backwards from the settlement discount amount to the debtor's control balance. Now, what is the debtor's? It's the invoice value. How do we calculate allowance for settlement discount? We take the invoice value, we take out the VAT, we multiply that by the settlement discount percentage. So if I give you this amount, I determine, I said, let's say the settlement discount uh, uh, amount was um, 5%. Then you will say, okay, well, that you're going to divide it by 5% to get to the full VAT exclusive amount. And then you're going to add the VAT 15% to get the debt discount balance for, the, uh, for that period. Right, let's talk about credit losses. Credit losses is credit losses written off. Now, that's the debit the credit losses expense account, credit debtors, if there was VAT involved, the credit losses expense account would have been the VAT exclusive amount. We would have debited VAT and credited debtors. Credit losses recovered, we don't have a debtor in our books anymore, so therefore we're going to receive money from a debtor that has already been written, is outstanding debt has already been written off. We're going to create an income account, credit income, credit losses recovered, which is the income account. If there's VAT involved, this will be the VAT exclusive amount, and we will credit VAT output with a VAT amount. Allowance for credit losses. Well, we said we have to update all our debtors' transactions first to get a final balance of our debtors' control balance. How, what are you going to do? You're going to take the debtors' balance. You're going to remove the VAT. You multiply that by the percentage for credit losses that you want. And that is going to be the value of your closing balance of the allowance of credit losses account, which will be shown in my note for trade other receivables which is statement of financial position. Good. <coughs> Sorry. The movement, if I had an existing balance in the beginning of the year on the allowance for credit losses account, I've now worked out what the balance should be at the end of the year. So that movement to get from the opening balance to the closing balance, that has to go through the income statement. So that's going to be either an income account or an expense account in the income statement. When will that be an income account? When my closing balance is less than my opening balance on the, of the allowance account. Then it means I have to debit my allowance account and credit my income statement. So it's an income. When will it be an expense? When my closing balance for credit losses is more than my opening balance for my allowance for credit losses. Then it will be expense in my income statement. Why? I have to credit my allowance account, so therefore the counter leg will be a debit in my income statement, i.e. an expense account. Trade and other receivables will then be debtors. We will start at your gross debtors, less allowance for settlement discount, less allowance for credit losses, net trade debtors. And then you're going to add all kinds of other debtors, like prepaid expenses. Remember, with prepaid expenses, the cash flow is already taken place, so prepaid expenses will always be exclusive of that. Deposits, now this is reclaimable deposits, so this deposit is repayable to the entity at some future stage. 
So that is a deposit I will show as part of trade and other receivables like municipality deposits or ESCOM deposits. It is repayable. Then accrued income. That is income that the entity is entitled on because the service was already delivered. Um, and that will always include that if no cash flow invoice was issued. But this is something that's originated by the entity itself. So that will probably always have that included. Cash and cash equivalents. Now, I've already discussed that. You should know exactly how to do the note. You have to distinguish between all the different types of accounts, like bank current account, petty cash, 32 days notice, then one total. If one of those uh, items included in that total is actually pledged as security for a loan, the fact must be mentioned and the full particulars of such a pledge should be shown. Um, if my bank had an overdraft balance, then you know that that overdrawn balance does not form part of the total of cash and cash equivalents. However, you must mention in your note that you have a bank overdraft facility and you must mention the amount of the overdraft facility. The bank overdraft balance will be shown on a separate line item under current liabilities, bank overdraft with a total involved. Trade and other payables will have a trade creditors uh, a section, which is my trade creditors equals my creditors control account balance, less allowance for settlement discount on creditors, net cr trade creditors. Other items included is things like accrued expenses. If I have already received the invoice uh, or the invoice was available, I will debit the expense or the asset with a VAT exclusive amount. I will claim the VAT and I will create accrued expenses. So that accrued expenses will include the VAT. If no invoice had been issued or could be issued, if you can request an invoice, this is not applicable. Now, what means here, I could not get an invoice at no circumstances. This guy is on his first space um, ride and he is something, he's going round around the world. So there's no ways I can contact him so that you can issue a VAT invoice or an invoice to me. Now, it is only in very exceptional cases that you cannot get hold of an invoice. All of us have telephones. All of us have uh, email capabilities. So obviously, all you have to do is to request an invoice. So in that very, very exceptional cases of not being able to get an invoice, then you will only debit the asset with a VAT exclusive amount and credit the crude expenses with a VAT exclusive amount. This will be happen around 0.00001% of the cases. So mostly accrued expenses will be a VAT inclusive amount. Income received in advance. So I've already received the income, I've already debited my bank, and at the date of receipt, I have to pay over the VAT to the receiver of revenue. So therefore, if there's still income received in advance in my books at year end, it must always be net of VAT because with the receipt of the money, I've already paid over the VAT to the receiver of revenue. Right, the VAT control account, if it says a credit balance, that will form part of trade and other payables. Property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment should be shown in the statement of financial position at the carrying value and carrying value equals the cost price of the assets less accumulated depreciation up to the end of the financial year. What is accumulated depreciation? That is the depreciation written off from the asset from the date of acquisition up to the end of the financial year, or if I've sold that asset during the course of the year up to the date of sale. What is depreciation? That is all the depreciation that I've written off on all the assets that was in the possession of the, of the entity during the course of the year. So it doesn't matter if I've sold that asset during the course of the year, but I've used that asset for a period of the year, that depreciation on that asset for the period that I've used the asset will be included in my expense account depreciation to show the total depreciation written off during the current financial period. Now, you should know that there are different ways and means that I can write off depreciation. The first method is the straight line method. Straight line method, I'm going to write off depreciation each year exactly at the same amount. The first step is to determine the depreciable amount of the asset. What is the depreciable amount? 
that is the cost price of the asset less the estimated residual value at the end of the useful lifetime of the asset. Now, that estimated residual value must always be a VAT exclusive amount. So if I give you a VAT inclusive amount, that is just to, con to confuse you, and you should know that you have to take out the VAT each and every time out of your estimated residual value. Now that's a depreciable amount. What am I going to do that? I'm going to divide that by the useful lifetime of the asset. Useful lifetime of the asset, if it's 10 years, then you know 100 divided by 10 equals 10% 10 per annum. If it's 5 years, it's 100 divided by 5, so that gives us 20% per annum. The second method I can apply is the diminishing balance method. Now, here depreciation is calculated on the carrying value of the asset as at the beginning of the current financial year multiplied by the percentage depreciation. I will always give you that percentage of depreciation. Included in that percentage that I'm giving you will already be the estimated residual value which was factored into the percentage that we have worked out that we want to write off of the asset. So under the diminishing balance method, this is the only method where you're going to ignore the estimated residual value because it's already included in that percentage. The production unit method, now here you have to determine the depreciable amount as well, cost less estimated residual value, exclusive of that. You have to determine the total capacity of the asset. Now, if it is a machine, it's most probably going to be the number of units that this machine can manufacture over its estimated useful lifetime. If it is a motor vehicle or car or truck or something to that effect, the total capacity is most probably the total number of kilometers that you expect this vehicle to travel up to the end of the current of its useful lifetime. Now depreciation under the production unit method is calculated per unit. I take the depreciable amount, I divide it by the total capacity, and that will give me my depreciation per unit. Now, if I want to work out my current year's depreciation, I will take the number of units, let's say it is a manufacturing environment, the number of units produced or manufactured by the machine for the year, and I will calculate it by the depreciation per unit, and that will give me my total depreciation charge on that machinery for the current year. All the same thing applies to vehicles on the number of kilometers driven. If I have the total kilometers driven in the current period, I have the depreciation per kilometer. That will give me my depreciation in total for the current year. So we multiply the depreciation per unit, the one we've worked out here, with the number of applicable units utilized in the current financial period. How do we work um, up to accumulated depreciation under the production unit method. Well, we will take again our total depreciation per unit. If we want to work accumulated depreciation at the beginning of the year, we will multiply that by the number of units produced up to the beginning of the current financial year. If you want to work it out up to the end of the financial year, you're going to take your depreciable value per unit and you're going to multiply that by the total number of units which was produced up to the end of the financial year. And that will give us our depreciation charge. Now, very important is this little purple block here. Depreciation is calculated from the date that the asset was ready to be used. So, um, in the first two methods, the straight line method, as well as the diminishing balance method, we have to um, accrue evenly over the year the depreciation charge. So, the, the question also always arises, at what date should we start with calculating the depreciation charge? And that is not the date that they actually start using the asset. It is the date where they could have started to use, it, use the asset because the asset was ready to be used. Very, very, very important. Under the production unit method, does this matter? No, it doesn't. Why? Because we base the depreciation here on the actual number of units produced or driven during the current financial year. So it is, doesn't matter when he started to drive it, he drove a number of kilometers, and that is what the depreciation charge is based on. So this purple block really only applies to the straight line method 
and the diminishing balance method. What do I do if I have, for instance, a factory and I depreciate my machinery at the straight line method or the diminishing balance, balance method, it doesn't matter, one of those two methods. And um, I close my factory on the 1st of December and I only open it up on the 2nd of January of the next year again. Long December months is usually shutdown months. We do not produce one single unit. It is holiday months and it is maintenance months. Okay, so what happens in a case like that? If we are only going to work out depreciation based on the straight line method and the diminishing balance method from the date that the asset was to be used, what about that one month in a year that the assets were not used? Guys, it doesn't matter. We ignore the fact that that month was an idle month. So let's say that uh, we will still then de work our depreciation based on the straight line method and the diminishing balance. Let's say that we have all our assets for the whole year, then it will be on a 12-month basis. It doesn't matter whether there was idle time during the month of December. So it will be worked out on the full period. We ignore the idle time. With the production unit method, again, it doesn't matter because we work on the actual number of units produced. Right, sales of uh, PPE as well as trading transactions of PPE. In this case, the steps stay the same. Let's say we have a normal sales transaction. The first question that you have to ask is, did we use the asset during the current financial period before the sale of the asset took place? And if the answer is yes, my first step is always to calculate depreciation for that period of the year that we have used the asset. So we will debit depreciation on that asset and we will credit accumulated depreciation. The second step always is to remove the cost of that asset out of our books. So we're going to debit a new account, the asset disposal account, and we're going to create the asset at cost, where we're going to take out the cost price of the asset that we've sold. This asset disposal account is only a temporary account. Once we have done the whole asset disposal transaction, that account should balance to zero, and the purpose of this account is to calculate either the profit or loss on the sale of the asset. Right, so we've removed the cost price of the asset out of our books. The th third step is to remove the accumulated depreciation out of the books. So we will debit accumulated depreciation and we will credit the asset disposal account. What is now lying in the asset disposal account? Cost less accumulated depreciation equals the carrying value of the asset. Then we're going to determine what the proceeds was. We're going to take the proceeds of the sale to the asset disposal account. So we're going to debit bank if we have received the amount in cash. If the amount is still outstanding, we're going to uh, debit the debtors account with the amount still owed by the guy who has bought the asset. And that will obviously be the VAT inclusive amount. We will create our asset disposal account with a VAT exclusive amount and then that included in that amount that we have received or that's still receivable is VAT. So we have to pay over the VAT to the receiver of re revenue. We're going to credit that output. Then we're going to balance off our asset disposal account. And depending on, on what side of that account we're going to need, need our balancing entry, that will determine whether that was a profit or a loss on the disposal of the asset. We will clean out the asset disposal account and the profit or the loss will be posted to either an income or an expense account. Where there was a trading transaction, guys, all the steps are exactly the same. I'm going to do step one as is, step two as is, step three as is. Step four, we're going to do determine the proceeds. That is still the same. The only thing happens is that this line item is going to go to a different account. Still with a bad inclusive amount, but it will just go to an account which will equal the trade-in partner's account. So the guy from, or where you're going to do the trading transaction, that trade-in creditor, you're going to debit his account. Now, you can ask me, why am I going to debit a creditor's account? Well, because it's a trading transaction, you also purchased a new uh, asset from that same guy, and the new asset is for sure at a higher value than the old asset. So we want to net off and determine what is the next uh, the net amount that we have to pay in for the new asset and that we do in his account. 
So we say with the trading transaction, you follow exactly the same steps as for the asset disposal. The only difference is that the bank data is going to be replaced with a counterparty of the trade-in transaction, i.e. the guy from where you have bought the new asset from. The next step will only be to account for the new asset. Then, then guys, once you have done these five steps, you are done with the old asset. So we are done with this first paragraph with the old asset. Now we have to record the new asset, and that is a normal acquisition of a new asset, a normal purchase account. You're going to debit the asset, you're going to debit with a VAT exclusive amount, debit VAT input, and credit this creditor that we have bought this asset from. Now the net balance on the counterparty's account, remember this will now be against the debit against the counterparty, this will be a credit against the counterparty, the amount that we owe, so the net amount would be the amount that he owed us, opposed to the amount that we owe him, and that will be the balance that we have to settle by ways of a, um, a bank uh, a transfer to this guy in order to settle the outstanding balance. So that will be the amount that you have to pay in cash flow on the new asset. Now, you can see that this also makes some room for interesting calculations. If I can give you or give you enough information to work out the proceeds on the old asset and I only give you the amount that you have to pay in on the new asset, if I add the two together, it will be the VAT inclusive price of the new asset. And then if you take out VAT and you can determine the cost price of the new asset. Have a look at all your examples that you have surrounding assets. Um, you have more than enough to, to practice this. Now, there's also other type of adjusting entries that pops up very often, rent received or pay, where there was an escalation during the year. Now, number one, calculate the number of months that you've received or paid the rent for. Work out the number of months that you have paid or received the old amount for. Work out the number of months that you have uh, received the escalated amount for. Um, here, let's say, was one month paid in advance. So, we have paid 13 months. Five months was at the normal rate, eight months was at the escalated, here yeah, was a 10% escalation at 1.1 of the normal rate. You will add the two together, you will go to your uh, income statement. Remember in the income statement or trial balance of your income statement balance accounts, expense accounts balances, there you will find the VAT exclusive amount. Um, so that will equal that amount that you've recorded in your books at this point of time. To work out the amount that you've paid in advance, it will be the escalated amount. So once you have resolved X, you will multiply that by 1.1. That's the escalated month, uh, amount, and that you will multiply by the number of months prepaid. In this example, there were 13 payments, so it's one month prepaid to get your um, prepaid expense account amount for the year. And the very same thing will apply if I have received rent then that would have been income received in advance. So for that uh, reason, you can see that rent paid in advance and rent received in advance will always be that exclusive amounts that you're going to record in your um, notes for trade and other viables. You have very good examples. You had an example there where you had that which was not removed out of the, I can't remember where it was rent paid, it was rent paid or rent received, I can't remember. And then you had to adjust your VAT control account with all these VATs and for the VAT purposes you had to work on the actual amounts paid for the year. But for the income statement purchases you had to work with how much rent were you entitled on for the current financial period. That's an excellent question so please go and check whether you understand that very well. Salary adjustments. Um, now, you should know that the gross salary is the amount that is debited against the salary expense account. So you always have to determine the gross salary if you have to adjust your salary expenses. Also, our employer contributions, that will force a salary-related cost. So you can either add it with your salary expense account or add it as a separate expense account item, but it's a salary-related cost, so employer contributions. That's the income statement impact. The statement of financial position impact 
is very often also asked for from you the net salaries that is payable to the employees now usually they are receiving their salary at the end of the month so in very few circumstances the net salary was still outstanding at the date that you prepare the statement of financial position but it's not to say that it cannot be outstanding so if the net salary hasn't been paid to the uh, the workers as yet at year end it will be a creditor in your books the net salary the one that is very often being asked is the deductions creditors because the deduction creditors are usually only being paid in the next financial year or the next financial month so the deductions for each and every one that has not yet been paid will be a creditors account for each and every one of them separately why? Because the counterparties are separate. Base you earn will go to Sarge. UIF will go to the UIF commissioner. It's a different party. Pension fund will go to the pension fund. It's a different party. Medical aid fund will go to a medical aid. It's a different party. So for each one of those deduction creditors, you will have a separate creditors account. And those separate accounts will be listed in your note for trade and other payables. Depreciation we have spoken about, interest calculations. Now here read very carefully. When the repayment will, of loans were made during the year, and if there was a repayment, did that repayment amount include only capital or include capital and interest? Now, if it only included capital, you will work out outstanding capital balances during different phases, uh, stages through the years, apply your interest percentage on those number of months outstanding to determine what was the interest expense or the interest income that you should recognize in the statement of profit or loss. Where your installment includes capital and interest, then the repayment amount must be split into the interest portion and the capital portion. I will however tell you this, that the amount paid includes capital and interest so those it will be specific, specifically stated there if that is the case you have to use the amortization table to do the split so the amortization table you used in order to split the uh, repayment into a capital component and an interest component make sure you can do that make sure you can actually do a uh, amortization table if I require from you to do the statement of financial position, your amortization table should also include the repayment of the next financial year. Why? Because you need to get the short-term portion of the long-term loan, that which is being shown as a current liability. And that would be the capital portion of the repayment of the next financial period. The long-term portion of the long-term loan, which is going to be shown as a non-current liability, that would be the outstanding loan amount at the end of the next financial year. But when I add the long-term portion plus the short-term portion together, that should come back to the total outstanding loan at the end of the current financial year. You only do the split if the question specifically states that the repayment includes capital and interest. If it doesn't include, if it's only capital repayments, you do not do the split. So don't try to split everything in capital and interest. It is only specifically when I tell you that the repayment includes capital and interest, we're going to show the, do the amortization table. Credit losses, credit losses recovered and allowance for credit losses we've spoken about. Closing inventories, you should remember it's at the lower cost or neutralizable values. And um, consumables like stationery, reduce the expense account and churn amount on hand as part of inventory so if there's still of the consumables on hand at the end of the year you take out that amount that's on hand that become part of inventory and it will reduce your expense for the year drawings remember drawings is always only part of equity drawings never ever will be featured in the income statement if you're going to put it drawings in the income statement minus two marks right away prepaid expenses we've spoken about remember prepaid expenses we've said this will always be a net of VAT, it will always be a VAT exclusive amount. And the same thing applied to income received in advance. Let's do a little example for this one. Let's say that the contract stipulates the contract price was 55,900 Rand with a 50% deposit which is payable at the date on the commencement of the contract. 
The contract commences on the 1st of December and the year end is 31st, 31 December. As at year end, 10% of the work was completed. Now, in a case like this, you have two types of transactions. It all relates to each other, but it's really two separate transactions. The first one is the receipt of the deposit. How much did we receive? 50% of 55,900. So we will debit bank 55,900 times 50%. 27,950. The VAT exclusive amount we can take to income, which will be 24,304, and we have to pay over the VAT included in the amount that we've received, which is 3,646. Come year end, we sit with an income there of 24,304. But here we have to now determine of on how much income we'll be entitled on for the current financial year. Now, for that, we're going to take the contract price. We have to take out the VAT, and we're only going to be able to, we have only earned, and we can only recognize 10% of the VAT exclusive contract price. So 10% of 55,900 divided by 1.15 gives us 4861. We currently have an income figure of 24,304. So the difference between the two, 19,443, we're going to take out of the income account, we're going to debit the income account, and we're going to credit income received in advance, 19,443. Now, the other way that you could have done the same transaction is we would have debited bank with a 27,950. We would have credited income received in advance with the 24,304, and we would have credited that 36,646. At year end, we're going to determine on how much income we'll be entitled on, and we have seen that we are entitled on 4861. Then we would have debited income received in advance with 4861, and we would have credited income with 4861. Now, in both of them, the end result would have been the same. We would have had in our income statement, revenue of 4861 and we would have had in our statement of financial position and the current liabilities income received in advance of 19443. So it doesn't matter which one of the two methods you're going to apply, both of them are correct. Guys, this is very important. Make sure that you can do all these entries. This is really what accounting is all about.